Well, good morning, everyone. And good day or good evening to those online who might be watching this later. So my topic today is, what is fundamental? And a topic like that given to a, a scientist, well, you're in for a little bit different today. <laughs> I spent 35 years as a LIDAR scientist and as a Christian trying to do my best to integrate the Christian faith with science. So I trust you've all had a good night's sleep. <laughs> the coffee drinkers have had their first cup. <clears throat> two, of our, two of our grandchildren were very safety conscious at a young age. <clears throat> And so I have to give you a piece of advice that they would give whenever they would get in the car, and that was, buckle up. <laughs> so some of background for me, uh, I love science and math as a student, and I, part of the, the reason why is that it just, it was such a nice framework, coherent framework is the word. It just fit together so nicely. <clears throat> but early, as a young man, I had a, a classic identity crisis. The big questions, what is life all about? Who am I? What's my purpose? <laughs> what is going on? And that, that crisis providentially led me to faith in Christ. And I found out in, in my searching for those answers, I found a God who was searching for me. And what I learned is that it's the most reasonable thing in the world to be a Christian. You don't have to throw out your mind or give up science to be, to be a Christian. And, <clears throat> and part of that was the influence of uh, Francis Schaeffer. He was one of the preeminent apologists of the 20th century. He had a community called Labrie, and I was providentially able to spend some time there. And I learned that Christianity does have a wonderful coherence. It, it just fits together. It explains things. What I'm going to talk about as part of fundamental is two fundamental books. Galileo, he was a believing scientist in the 17th century. And there's a very common notion at that time that there were two fundamental books. One was the book of nature. So what we could see around us and learn from. The other was the book of Revelation. Both of these books express truth. They can bring us to knowledge. And they have the same author, God himself. So they must be compatible. If there's a contradiction between them, it is only an apparent contradiction. We have to figure out which one, how to interpret one or the other so that they are compatible. God is simply communicating to us in two different ways, and we must, and he's given us the ability to do this, <clears throat> which I'll show. Galileo himself, he was caught in a very big controversy at the time. Uh, what was at the center? Because up till then, you know, the earth was at the center of everything, and the church at the time was interpreting the scripture to back that up. But then Galileo, Copernicus, they figured out from observation that, no, 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 the sun is at the center of the solar system. So Galileo famously said this, the intention of the Bible is to teach how one goes to heaven, not how the heavens go. So I'm going to, this is where the roller coaster starts. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about what's, what's, what's really fundamental in nature. What are the basic building blocks? And what's at the foundation of it all? Well, there's two things in nature. That's forces and particles. There are four fundamental forces, and two of them you're quite familiar with. Gravity, it's actually the weakest of all four. But it's infinite in range, and that's why we're all able to stay in our seats. The, the center of the earth, the earth is pulling us 
is attracting us, and we're actually we're attracting the earth too, but that's why we're able to stay in our seats, gravity. And that's how this, the planets revolve around the sun. So we know that one. I'll skip to the third one, because we know that one too. It's electromagnetism. So magnets have north and south poles. They can attract, repel. It's actually um, the, the third, the second strongest, but it also has infinite range, so it's always there. The other two here are in the nucleus. There's a, something called the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is really important because it keeps protons together inside the nucleus because protons are positively charged, they should, they do, repel each other because of electromagnetism. But the strong force is the strongest. <laughs> it beats out electromagnetism, keeps our atoms from flying apart. So four fundamental forces, four. GUT, or GUT. It stands for the Grand Unified Theory. It's like the holy grail of physics and cosmology to try to combine all these four forces into one theory. And people have been working on it for a long, long time. And including a very famous scientist, Albert Einstein. <clears throat> Before I get into that, though, a little aside, I want to talk a little bit about relativity versus relativism, because they're not the same. Einstein came up with his theory of special theory and general theory relativity in the early 20th century. And as that theory crept into the contemporary culture, it led to relativism, basically. That, oh, everything's relative. Einstein said so. <laughs> and that led to moral relativism. Well, it's not true because there's one unshakable absolute in the theory of relativity, which Einstein was brilliant to establish, and that's that the speed of light is exactly the same no matter where you are or how fast you're moving. It's exactly that many meters per second. They've actually redefined the meter to make that have no decimal places. <laughs> so. In, in relativity theory, there's one absolute absolute, and that is the speed of light. So that's one example how things have creep into modern culture, but it's, it still has a very strong absolute in it. Well, <clears throat> after he did all his amazing work, he still worked away at Princeton, and he devoted the latter half of his life to trying to come up with a grand unified theory. But like he with so many others, it hasn't yet happened. It hasn't yet happened. So that's forces. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about particles. Well, the atom was the most fundamental particle for a long time. And actually the term comes from ancient Greece. And the term atom means uncuttable, something you can't break apart. And so up until the 20th century, that was the case. The atom was basically it. Now, we do know we're all made of atoms, <laughs> but the first cut came in the early 20th century. They found the atomic nucleus, and so they found out that the atom was actually had a tiny, tiny nucleus at the center with electrons uh, buzzing around it. And then they found out there were things even inside the nucleus. In, in uh, 1919, they found the proton. And then in, in the 30s, they found the neutron. So the tiny, tiny part of the atom at the center actually had components inside it, protons and neutrons. <clears throat> so they want to find out more. Okay. Are the protons and neutrons, are they, are they fundamental? Are they, is that where it stops? <clears throat> well, what they did, they wanted to find out, they, they build accelerators, <clears throat> and they've gotten bigger and bigger, and what they would do is they would take protons in this giant ring, and they would accelerate them to very nearly the speed of light in two counter directions, and then they would slam them together. 
and see what debris came out. And this picture here is an example of, of tracks they would see. So after this tremendous collision, they would see all these tracks in their cloud chamber, and they, from the direction of the track, the way it curled, it went right or left, relative to the magnetic field, they could figure out its charge, they could do all this stuff. Well, so they used this to look for new fundamental particles. The problem was, there was an absolute zoo that came out. They found hundreds and hundreds of stuff, of particles that they hadn't heard of, seen before. And they were trying to make sense of it. So, okay, is there something really we're missing here? Well, yes, in the mid-60s, it was proposed, and it wasn't, you know, this was just an idea, it was proposed that the proton was made of something called a quark. Three quarks in the proton. And yes, that's the name of the CBC science show, Quirks and Quarks, that's where it comes from. So the proton, which thought would be fundamental, was, had three quarks in it, and so did the neutron, different ones. <coughs> And they finally found evidence for it, like in the late 60s, and then they trying to figure out all the stuff they were seeing, and they came up with a theory that had even more quarks. So they came up with six quarks. <laughs> and by the mid-90s, they had evidence for all six of them. And so this theory that this fellow came up with, well, it, was, it, it, it came to be true. So how's the roller coaster rise so far? <laughs> I'm getting there. Okay, so this is, a, this is my busiest slide. <laughs> so I'm going to cut to the chase. So there's, there's 17 fundamental particles, not just quarks. <clears throat> and I have to add just briefly here, there's actually 34 fundamental, well, there's more than this because each of the particles has an antiparticle. Antimatter does exist. It's not just in the engines of Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about antimatter today. That's, yeah, we'll just skip that. We'll just skip to the normal matter. Oh, let me go back here. So, <clears throat> so there are some familiar friends here in this slide. There's the photon and the electron. So you can see those there. Um, the electron is, well, I'll get to that. <clears throat> So, up at the top, we have the six quarks in the blue there. And this is proof that scientists do have a sense of humor because the names of these six quarks are up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom. I kid you not. <laughs> and thus far, they've been able to probe these quarks, there... I should have had some way to give the scale here, but the, the proton is exceedingly small. Well, there's three quarks in each proton, and they, they believe the quarks are 10,000 times smaller than the proton. So, essentially, they are a point particle. And that's the... Hopefully, that's, that's as far as we go. <laughs> The six on the bottom are called leptons, and that's kind of a funny name, but it actually comes from a Greek word that means small and delicate, leptos. So these six on the bottom are leptons, and they're, they're small and delicate, and that's some of their characteristics. And on the three on the very right are three types of neutrinos. And they are very shy. In addition, in addition to being small and delicate, they are very, very shy. <clears throat> the sun is putting out an unbelievable amount of energy and light, but it's also putting out an incredible number of neutrinos. If everyone looks at their thumbnail and counts for one second, a hundred billion neutrinos just went through your thumbnail. But these things are so shy, they don't interact with anybody. They just fly by. They, they just, just see you, I'm not talking to you today. They're just going. <laughs> and it takes huge 
uh, instruments, and there's one in Sudbury, a huge tank of special fluid to try to just even detect a few of these billions and billions that are, that are flying by us. So, so in this, so that's 12 of them. So the last five have this funny name, bosons. It's named after a very famous Indian scientist, Bose. And they're, they're the ones that uh, transfer force and so on. So a photon is one. There's other ones there, but the, the one in the very center is very special. It's called the Higgs boson. In, in also in the mid-60s, the scientist Peter Higgs, he proposed as part of this model that was developing a very fundamental particle, and it became to have his name, the Higgs boson, and it was only proven to exist 50 years later in 2012, 10 years ago, was when they found it. They built this huge accelerator collider outside Geneva, and they, they proved it existed uh, 10 years ago. So, a little aside here, at the time, people may have remembered that they talked about the God particle, that became the nickname for the Higgs boson. It was so elusive, it was so big, and it's the one that actually gives everything mass. Without, without this in the picture, they couldn't figure out how anything had mass, but the Higgs boson is the one that does it. But to me, these particles were all made by God. <laughs> it's not just the Higgs boson that's a God particle, they are all God particles. But when they found it, this really cemented this standard model that they called it of all these particles. And it's lasted for 50 years, since the mid-60s. <clears throat> as far as the grand unified theory, they have, they've combined three of the four. Gravity has still not uh, been able to be incorporated. <clears throat> and this standard model <clears throat> And uh, let me repeat, so we're all made up of atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons. And both protons and neutrons are made up of two of the lightest quarks, up and down, if you really want to know. <laughs> but that means that only three particles make up virtually everything we see around us and experience every day. Two quarks and an electron. And this standard model, it can be easily argued that it's one of the highest achievements of the 20th century. Over the course of its development, um, over 50 people received the Nobel Prize in Physics for it. You know, even up to 2020, when uh, Roger Penrose won. And... <clears throat> I really figured it would be a bridge too far if I showed equations this morning. I really did. <laughs> that would... I'd be looking for the tar and feathers. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to show you something. So, the standard model can be written down on a single sheet of 8.5 by 11 paper. I don't understand it. No way. <laughs> But the fact that God made this universe and gave us the brains to figure out what's behind it all, what's at the bottom of it all, that, that just blows me away. And that, that it can be written down on, a, on one sheet of paper. <clears throat> well, you might ask, why, you know, this... Okay, this is a mini introduction to particle physics this morning, which I'm sure you were not expecting. <coughs> Why did God make it so complicated? That's the complicated equation there. Well, differential calculus is complicated, for sure. <laughs> and actually, a lot of scientists were disappointed that 10 years ago, we only saw the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle, because they had been inventing more and more theories about what's happening, how to account for this and that, and they were expecting to see many more exotic particles. But 
they only saw the Higgs particle at this Large Hadron Collider. And in fact, the standard model can be argued to be the simplest one possible to produce the universe we see. Uh, Neil Turek, he's the director of the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Ontario. He has this great YouTube video uh, from a few years ago, the astonishing simplicity of everything. And he says this, the universe has turned out to be stunningly simple. The universe has surprised everyone. It's simpler than any of our models can explain. And here he talks about finding the Higgs particle. The same thing happened at the Large Hadron Collider. Again, nature has used the most simplest possible way. It's so simple we don't understand how nature got away with it. So yes, it's a complicated model, but at, 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 at base it's, it's simple. It's, not, it's something we can figure out. And God did it that way. So, in addition to forces, particles, there's constants in nature. The force with which we are pulled down in our chairs by gravity is driven by the gravitational constant. If it was twice as big, we'd probably all be lying flat on the floor and not able to get up. If it was half, we might be, <laughs> well, we'd be all way a lot lighter. That'd be nice. <laughs> But there's constants in all that we see around us, electromagnetic constants, and what people are finding out is that they're all fine-tuned to an amazing degree, that we, that we can actually live in this universe. This universe has just the right conditions for us to be here, as far as the constants go. We're just the right distance from the sun. Our planet is just the right um, our solar system is just the right part of the galaxy. It goes on and on and on. And the more scientists look into it, the more amazing it is that the universe is fine-tuned. And as Christians, we can point to the grand designer of everything as the reason for that. <clears throat> but science, by definition, doesn't deal with the supernatural. So... What is a possible natural explanation for this incredibly fine-tuned universe? Well, it's the multiverse. <clears throat> and <clears throat> before I get into that, I want to just see a show of hands. Who here knows what the MCU stands for? Show of hands. MCU. Oh, gee. I'm, I'm a little surprised. There should be... <laughs> I guess the vast majority here aren't moviegoers. <laughs> it stands for the Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> and they, they are getting into this big time. <clears throat> um, this is another example of how science has crept into culture. Here we see three Peter Parkers, because each of them came from a different universe of the multiverse. That's the latest Spider-Man movie. And then, of course, the latest Doctor Strange movie. It's right in the title, Multiverse of Madness. <clears throat> and the question why it, it's incredibly popular. They're making a lot of money making this Marvel multiverse cinematic universe. <laughs> there was an interesting BBC article earlier this year uh, talking about why it was so popular. And this author said, the trend might have deeper reasons behind it. It could be a response to the feeling so often expressed on social media that our own reality is so absurd and dystopic, dystopian that there must be a better timeline out there somewhere. And my thinking is, if, if, if that is true, then these people have to hear about the hope and purpose there is in the Christian faith, for sure. Well, having possible parallel universe, it's actually a very old idea, but fine-tuning of the universe we live in has brought it back very strongly. And that's because if you don't have God in the picture, you have to resort to a huge number of infinite 
parallel universes, and there, you know, the eye thinking is that while well, the constants of universe A are slightly different from the universe B, C, and so on, and there actually have been scientific papers written to show that the vast number of these other universes would be uninhabitable. They would not be able to, we would not be able to live in them if the, you know, if those constants were tuned away from where they are now, even by a few percent. <clears throat> and the thinking is that there's a whole bunch of these out there, and we've sim simply been the winners of a huge lottery because we happen to live in the one that's just right. Well, there's no evidence of being more than one universe. These are just speculation and ideas. And actually, even the theories behind it s suggest that there's no way we can even communicate with these other universes. That's it's impossible. And so in instead of accepting a single infinite God, they are postulating an infinite number of other universes. So, but you have to ask, which is simpler here? Which, which is more sensical? <laughs> and just to wrap up the multiverse, even if, multi, even if they do exist, even if they do, they all should, also had to start. They had to have a beginning. There's been theorems that say if something's expanding, well, it had to have a beginning. And so you still need a cause for the multiverse. You still do, even if they exist. Okay, we're gonna, it's been a lot on the book of nature here, but, oh, you get that other book 51 weeks out of the year, so I figured that was okay. <laughs> um, what can we know of God just from science? Well, the incredible fine-tuning points to a designer. It just does. So there's a designer of the universe. The start of the universe, it, it had to have started. And that points to some personal agent. And I say personal because some, someone, a person or an a, agent, whatever you could, had to make the decision, okay, let's start it up now. Otherwise, it just would have continued as it was. So someone had to make a choice to start it, to turn that key. And this agent is incredibly powerful. There's a lot of energy in the universe. It, it did not come from nothing. Only nothingness can come from nothingness. This personal agent, it's multidimensional. So, you know, the theory suggests that there are actually more dimensions than just space-time. What can we learn from the science of biology? That we're incredibly, wonderfully made. The human body is one of the most intricate things <laughs> in the universe. It is. I mean, it's... Yes, the sun is complicated, but it's, it's only got hydrogen and helium and some other elements in it. But, you know, the feedback mechanisms, all that, it's just amazing. The other thing we can learn by looking around us is that the world is broken. And we can see that in our bodies. They break down illness, disease, cancer. So the book of nature only takes us so far. And what we need is the other book to have a more complete knowledge of God and, and, and what's going on. And this is even told to us in our revealed book of scripture from Romans chapter 1. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And that's what we've been talking about this morning. Revel Revelation, we, we can tell from looking around that the world is broken. Revelation tells us why. It is broken. We need revelation to tell us, to know that, yeah, we've been separated from God 
And this book tells us the way back to God. And that way back is through a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. So, another GUT, not a grand unified theory, but a grand unifying truth about the world is Christianity. And the center of that is Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And talking about the creator God, well, <clears throat> it, was, it was our Christian God, a personal God, and that's, he's a person, and that's why we all have consciousness. Science cannot still ex cannot explain why this three pounds of meat inside our heads has a consciousness with it. They cannot explain that, but we do. Well, it's because we are created by a, a personal God. In the beginning, in Genesis, the first verse, God created. And the first verse of John, in the beginning was the Word. Scripture tells us, the book of Revelation, that it was actually Jesus, the Logos, that caused everything to come into existence. In Colossians 1, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And I have to just remember your thumbnail when you see that word invisible there. <laughs> Those billions of neutrinos that are, that are flying around. Something else we learn from Revelation is that it was three persons in one creator God. We learn this only from the Bible. The Trinity is unique to the Christian faith. The fact there are three persons in one God. It's hard to understand, yes, it's a mystery, yes. But it has been revealed to us. And what's significant about that is that God did not have to create us to experience love. If you had a, mo a single, one-person one God, well, that, they would not be able to experience love because you need another person to experience love. Love existed from all eternity within the persons of the Trinity. And this Christian God created out of love. So <clears throat> this makes ultimate reality, not forces, particles, quarks, but it's love. That's the ultimate reality and foundation of it all. I'm going to go back just quickly to <laughs> a proton here, and you can see that it's made of two up quarks and one down quark, two of one, one of the other. And here's another, the, the force that's keeping those three quarks together, it's actually called a gluon. I kid you not, it's a gluon, that's a force. <laughs> And the proton is one of the most stable things one can find. They, if, if you took a neutron out of a, out of a nucleus, it would decay in like 15 minutes. But a single proton, they estimate its lifetime to be 10 with 30 zeros behind it. It's, it's the most stable thing one can imagine. And it's special because if you just simply add an electron to a proton, well, you get hydrogen. And that's the most abundant element in the entire universe. <clears throat> so here we just have the, the Godhead, the Trinity. So there's three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what binds them together but love? And I, I know it's just numbers, but... I find it interesting that <clears throat> there's a three-person trinity. The most, one of, some of the most basic building blocks we know of are made of three quarks. There are actually three generations of quarks. We, nobody knows why. And I just think, well, is God putting his thumbprint upon his nature? 
it takes a tremendous force to pull apart the proton. And I explained this accelerator, they sp speed these things up, smash them into each other. But imagine what it would take to pull apart the Trinity. And this did happen once in all of eternity. It happened when Jesus was on the cross. So, in a terrible irony, it was love itself which ripped apart the bonds of love in the Trinity so that we could be saved. Each of us matters so much to God that this happened so that we could be back in a love relationship with, with him. So God is love. The Bible's been called a love letter from God to the world. And we see that in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. First John tells us we love because God first loved us. The love chapter tells us without love we are nothing. So love is absolutely the key. You know, a lot of these particles, they can't be observed directly. We can only see them in a cloud chamber when there are interactions with others. Love itself can't be measured directly or seen, but it can be evidenced in interactions with one another. So a, a challenge for you today and for me is in the tracks of our lives, as we go through our day or week, if someone were to observe us, would they see evidence of love in our path, in our interactions with others? So I'm going to sum up. I think I'm going a little over. <laughs> uh, there are absolutes in science. But in talking about the book of nature, it will always be open. This standard model that I showed you briefly, it might get replaced, you know, by smarter people. <clears throat> but more fundamental than nature is Revelation, the book of Revelation. And this book of Revelation, it's not open. It was, it's closed. Jesus is the final word, and it brought back to me a song that's showing my age by Michael Card. It's called The Final Word, a wonderful, wonderful song. He spoke the incarnation, and then so was born the Son. His final word was Jesus. He needed no other one. So Jesus, he is the grand unifying truth and the life and love Love is the fundamental foundation of it all. And while they're searching for knowledge in both faith and in science, the most important truth is the knowledge of Jesus and in knowing him to have life in his name. Let us pray together. Lord, you have made an amazing, amazing universe. And you've given us the ability to figure it out. And you are the God of wonders. And even this week, as we look beyond our own galaxy with the first images of the James Webb Telescope, it's just, it just proclaims even greater your glory and your majesty in the heavens. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to evidence and demonstrate your love in the tracks of our lives as we go about the life you have given us. Amen.